everybody, and thanks for joining us. My name is Rhiannon Price, and I am Managing Director with Dev Global Partners, and I'm looking forward to moderating this session on data sharing. We've got a rock star lineup uh, with Yao Anakwa, Hamid Ali Mohammed, and Catherine Nakalembe here to share their experiences from very different perspectives within the kind of data ecosystem working with smallholder farmers. So I'm very excited to, to kind of kick off initially presentations and then a discussion. So first I'd love to introduce Yao. Yao is the CEO of uh, Open Data Kit or ODK. And ODK's mission is to design, build, deploy, and support offline data collection software that help organizations have a social impact. And Yao also holds a PhD in computer science from the University of Washington. Uh, looking forward to hearing um, some of the stories you have to share today, Yao. We're also joined by Hamid Ali Mohammed, who's the chief data scientist and recently appointed executive director of Radiant Earth Foundation, uh, which is a nonprofit organization aiming to use the power of Earth observations data to enable the global community to tackle environmental and development challenges. Uh, Hamid also serves as an elected member of AGU's technical committee on remote sensing. Uh, and previous to Radiant Earth, he was a postdoctoral research scientist at Columbia University's Earth and Environmental Engineering Department and holds a PhD in Civil and Environmental Engineering from MIT. And last but certainly not least, uh, Catherine Nakalembe is an assist assistant professor at the University of Maryland. Uh, she also serves as the Africa Program Director for NASA Harvest, which is NASA's Food and Security Agriculture Program. Um, she's also served as a member of NASA's Severe Applied Sciences team, as well as the Agriculture and Food Security Thematic Lead, or excuse me, Thematic Lead. Um, she also happens to be the 2020 Africa Food Prize Laureate for her dedication to improving the lives of smallholder farmers by using satellite technology to harness data to guide agricultural decision making. Um, so excited to have the three of you here today. Um, with that, I want to jump right in, so I'm going to um, kick it over here to Yao to, to start us off with his presentation. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Yao Anakwa from ODK, and I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the innovations that we've been doing in ODK that we believe help improve data sharing at scale. Um, I know some of you uh, on the call and, and some of you who are watching do know what ODK is, but for those who aren't, I wanted to just do a quick introduction um, for you. So ODK at the heart lets you connect, collect data anywhere. It's really a set of offline tools uh, that help you build powerful offline forms to collect data you need, you know, wherever it is. Um, ODK's focus is on social impact. So whether or not you're doing disease surveillance or election monitoring or, or ground truthing for crops, um, ODK's focus is on social impact and our goal is to make the world data, uh, the world better uh, through data. ODK is free and open source software. Um, for those who've been in it for a long time, you know this already. Um, historically, ODK has always been sort of self-installed. Um, as of a few weeks ago, we now offer cloud hosting, turnkey cloud hosting, um, which is, we think is the easiest way to sort of get started with ODK. You just push a button and we give you a server and you're ready to go, no technical skills needed. Uh, for those who want more, we also have launched consulting services, which let you get expert help with everything from local hosting to form design to sponsored features. So at a high level, that's sort of what ODK is. The, the features that we think make ODK super compelling for folks um, are, well, um, one is that uh, it lets you build powerful offline forms. So if you're collecting GPS locations or photos and you want skip logic and complex calculations about how big a farm is, you can do all of that offline with ODK. Um, and yes, everything works offline, both the mobile app and we have a web app that lets you collect data um, either on iOS or with any web browser. And everything works offline and then things are sort of synchronized to the server when you have a connection. And then the last thing, which I'll be talking about uh, a bit more today is, uh, it lets you analyze the data with ease. Um, we have a new ODK server that I'll be talking about, which lets you sort of download your data, obviously, um, but you can also connect directly to the server with Power BI or R or Tableau, and that enables a new kind of data sharing at scale that um, is, um, is new. Um, one interesting thing about ODK that I always like to share um, is that you know, our focus is social impact. Um, and unlike some other tools in this space, we take a broad approach. So you see ODK being used at WHO for COVID-19. Um, you see it being used in Honduras for 
uh, monitoring educational progress of millions of students. The Jane Goodall Institute uses it for chimpanzee monitoring. Um, and recently in Nigeria, uh, there's a big ag project that's using it to map farms, uh, about 2 million farms. And I think that project has something on order of 50, you know, 70,000 enumerators out in the field collecting farming data. Um, so ODK really tries to be a data collection tool that's used across all these domains. Um, we have launched a new server uh, that we call ODK Central, and that's what I'm going to be talking about uh, very briefly, just to get people excited about the, this idea of, of, of data sharing. And um, so ODK Central is a new modern ODK server. It's really, it's crazy fast. I mean, it's just unbelievably fast at scale. Um, and it's designed to be really easy to use. Um, I'm not going to talk about all the awesome features that it has. For this purpose, I really want to focus on our OData feed. So OData is a new standard um, that um, some folks like uh, Microsoft and Tableau have, have been working on and contributing to, which is a new standard for transferring data between uh, tools and services. Uh, for those who are technical on the, uh, uh, who are watching this, it's essentially, essentially a JSON feed. Um, and for those who are not technical, it's essentially a link that you can paste either into Tableau or you can paste into Power BI or you can paste into Excel and it, it gets a live connection from the server. And so you can build your dashboards and, um, and, and do your reporting that way. Um, we also have enabled uh, our uh, support with it as well. So if you use R, you can just plug it in. The thing that's really exciting about this is that all your data now doesn't have to be shuttled back and forth with CSVs. Um, if you want to share a data set, you just share that link with whomever you want. They plug it into whatever software they want. They combine it with whatever data sources they want. Um, and then they can be up and running. And so we're really excited about this functionality in ODK. Um, and so, um, yeah, I want to end my talk here and say, um, ODK has been around for 12 years. Um, the project is, is now more popular than ever. Uh, and we hope with uh, tools like our OData feed our new server, uh, we can enable more data sharing uh, and especially at scale. So I'll stop here. Um, thanks, uh, Yao, for that intro to ODK. It's one of my favorite software tools that I, I use in my work. Um, I will be today sharing about how we're using um, data and how sharing it has made a lot more things possible. And so just briefly, I'm from uh, the University of Maryland and I work for NASA Harvest and uh, my work focuses on agriculture and food security. I work uh, primarily in, in Africa, in Eastern Africa, as well as in um, West Africa. Um, our program is NASA's Agriculture and Food Security Program. It's NASA's contribution to the Global Agriculture Monitoring Initiative. And our focus is to enable and enhance uh, the use of satellite uh, Earth observations and agriculture monitoring uh, to benefit um, human and environmental resilience. So our Harvest program, as I mentioned before, focuses uh, primarily in Africa and uh, through a lot of partnerships and initiatives, we've been able to partner in Kenya and Tanzania, Uganda, Rwanda, and Mali. And some of our successes have been uh, built through uh, a lot of capacity building. So we prioritize enhancing knowledge and skills, competencies across uh, the different countries where we're working for, pe for people to use and take advantage of um, earth observations for their own agriculture monitoring and instilling this uh, knowledge and, and tools within their institutions so that it doesn't operate outside of it, but that they take advantage of those tools and use them how they see fit. Um, some of the tools that have been have made this possible is um, the crop monitors that uh, customize systems that enable using more advanced satellite products coming, for example, from the early morning explorer. Um, from the top right, and then uh, the global culture monitoring system, which is an archiving, it's like a data cube for satellite data, which enables analysts to look at conditions over time and how they compare to the longer term. And um, using tools uh, for field data collection and my primary tool that I've uh, pretty much used across all these countries where we're working physically on the ground has been um, ODK, which is uh, pretty cool because it enables us to customize and um, adapt that tool to the specific need of that country, for example, using multiple languages. And this is, this is really paid off. Uh, for example, more recently, we're working in Mali. We're able to develop a tool that is in English and French and in Bambara. And uh, one of the core successes, of course, has been setting up these uh, crop 
systems that are built off of the global crop monitor for AMS and a crop monitor for early warning. Um, these have been adapted for, um, for monitoring at the region within East Africa and uh, operational ones in Tanzania, in Uganda and in Kenya. Uh, there's one in development for Rwanda as well as um, in Mali. So our work has been focusing on improving baselines as well, trying to make sure that the data that goes into the systems is high quality. And to do this uh, is, is very tough in the, when you're looking at smallholder agriculture because it is a livelihood, a uh, source of livelihood for farmers. Um, there's low productivity, low inputs, the farmers face challenges, including pests and diseases. And you wanna be able to support policy that can help farmers get out of uh, this vicious circle of uh, failing fields, as well as uh, continuous um, reduction in productivity. But monitoring agriculture with satellite is very complex. It's, it's very difficult because of the complex system. We have very small fields, they're mixed. Uh, they're irreg irregular, you have intercropping, and those that have tried to use satellite data to do analyses or try to track what's going on, it's, 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 it's really impossible uh, when you don't have access to high resolution data, when you don't have access to high quality um, ground data to be able to train your, um, your algorithms to develop important data sets like cropland maps. And so uh, building on these uh, really important aspects that make it work, the capacity that I mentioned before, having high quality satellite data, making sure that workflows are automated. One of the key things is access to field data and linking with um, other efforts to make sure that it's sustained, as well as being able to unpack that information and make it useful for farmers. So we've had to be innovative. And um, some of what we've done more recently is um, integrating different data sources. So we have data, for example, from um, the GeoWiki, which is a, a huge open uh, data set that you can use for uh, mapping crops. We have accessed, we've developed our own training data. This is 2020, so going to the field is qu quite challenging, but we've been able to do on-screen digitization, you know, to kind of label uh, fields that are crop versus not in crop using, for example, planet data here, um, as well as having this network of extension agents that uh, we've trained over the years to be able to go in and collect data on crop type, which is, uh, which is important. And then we combine that with machine learning algorithms and are able to produce, for for example, in uh, 2020, we were able to produce a cropland map for Togo from 2019 uh, without having access to ground data in Togo, as well as producing a, 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 a 10 meter 2019 cropland map for Kenya. And we are right now running a, a 2020 version of this. But one of the, I think that the critical things that we've learned over the years is, you know, one of the things is just having access to data. So in order to do the cropland map for Kenya, we were able to combine data that we access through Radiant Earth through a partner, uh, Plant Village, who were willingly shared their data. Uh, this made a very big difference because we were able now to develop a more complicated uh, model to be able to do crop type classification in season for 2020 for, for Kenya. This, important, this information is really important for decision making. And so, um, it wouldn't be possible if that data wasn't shared. Um, and being able to do this, of course, means that we have to work with partners. Um, and uh, we've tried to leverage and maximize what each individual partner can provide us. And um, I'm gonna stop here uh, and just say that being able to produce timely in season or uh, relevant information for food security monitoring in most cases requires that partners share, share across and those that are on the ground, especially right now in 2020 can provide critical information that can tell us how crops or fields are doing that, uh, that would be really critical for food security monitoring. Thank you. Uh, hello everyone, um, thank you Rhiannon and the organizers of the convention for inviting me and thank you to Jan and uh, Catherine for laying the ground for my presentation. I appreciate all the discussion and the, and the need for data. Uh, so I'm with Radiant Earth Foundation uh, and I'm, today I'm going to talk about Radiant ML Hub, uh, which is a, a repository, if I may call it, for, for machine learning ready geospatial data. Uh, before talking about that, I want to spend a couple of seconds talking about Radiant. So we are a nonprofit organization. Uh, with a mission to empower organizations and individuals to better use the satellite imagery, particularly open satellite data, with machine learning techniques to address uh, world 
critical challenges, including agricultural monitoring and food security. And really what we envision is a community that can leverage these technologies better to have a global impact. Uh, we are not a last mile organization. We are really a catalyzer to help organizations on the ground be more successful. Um, our vision is about how can we address these challenges in geospatial America, particularly when we talk about agriculture. This is, I think, even more pronounced. Um, we just heard from Catherine about the accessibility and the use of ground data for doing that machine learning at a scale. But when you think about it across the particular development sector, there is a lack of geodiversity in these data. We don't have these kind of uh, ground reference data across all the regions that we need to do this monitoring. Uh, there is definitely a scarcity of that data. We don't have access to those in every, every location. Even when data is available, it is not accessible. You can't easily find it. You can't easily look for it and then put it into your modeling or your monitoring dashboard. There is interoperability issue. These data sets don't talk to each other. There are different formats. There are different uh, uh, kind of cataloging standards. And then they are not necessarily what we call ML ready, meaning that, uh, hey, uh, for example, ML engineer is not necessarily a geospatial expert, right? So having a data which is ready for fusing into an ML application is a different readiness level than being a geospatial uh, ready data. So addressing these challenges is required. Otherwise, we'll be uh, in a cycle of having models that are not necessarily accurate or applicable across wider regions. So to address these, this is what we have established, what we call an ML commons for Earth observation. Uh, the key pillar of this is the hub, which is the repository for hosting these open access training data sets. Um, and soon in future, with the support that we have got from NASA, uh, hosting also ML models. So when there is an open ML model uh, on that data set, we can host it and people can easily discover and access it. Uh, building a community around this, so it is not just about the data hosting, a, a community of practice that uses this data, either through competitions or contributing to data, or working on the standards and interoperability kind of best practices. How can we do this better and learn from each other and move forward? Uh, and lastly, doing uh, education and market uh, dissemination with sharing those best practices, uh, running workshops and convening so people uh, get exposed to the latest uh, developments in this space. Uh, just an overview slide of what is ML Hub. In practice, it is basically several storage uh, on the crowd uh, it is not just one bucket. It can be distributed across different clouds, whether it's commercial cloud or private cloud. Um, our bucket is on Amazon Web Services, but we also have data from other cloud providers. Uh, users come to us through an API and a dashboard so they can easily access these standard catalogs of the data. Uh, this is part of our effort working with the community to define that standard catalog. Uh, and this is the only kind of harmonization part that helps people to access the data the same way. So no matter where the data is hosted, they access it through the same API or dashboard and they can easily consume that. They have the same standard, the same metadata definition and the same kind of quality control. Um, and there are different ways of accessing that API, whether it's through the, just the API endpoint, we have a Python client coming up. Uh, there's also a web portal for searching and accessing the data. Uh, everything is open access. There is an authentication, but everybody can sign up and access the data. So uh, feel free to go to mlhub.earth and start exploring the data. Uh, I will also talk briefly about some of the data sets we have. Uh, we recently released a uh, land cover. Now, this is a data set uh, uh, generated by Radiant team. Uh, it is a, a human verified, basically, land cover classification data set using time series of Sentinel-2, which is the global satellite at 10 meter resolution. Uh, the version one covers Africa, uh, which is uh, about, I think, 130 million pixels uh, of data. And this is uh, a consensus algorithm. So we have multiple users uh, basically verifying that label and sharing it online. This is now available on Radian and Hub and just some snapshots of that. Uh, particularly in agriculture, we have several data sets now hosted, uh, two from Kenya, uh, uh, from the plant village team that Catherine also mentioned. In Tanzania and Uganda, these are already hosted data. Uh, we also have data from other, uh, basically, partners. It is not just Radiant doing this, and this is a key aspect of this. This is a community uh, effort. Uh, we have SpaceNet data from across the world. We have Big EarthNet, which is another land cover classification, uh, and some other on like uh, uh, moisture fuel content in the US as well. Uh, but the exciting thing is the data we are going to share uh, in the next couple of weeks, particularly in fall. Uh, these are various crop types, uh, one from Mali that uh, Catherine has been the PI of that, and 
just so that the data has been collected with ODK. So there is a lot of connection here between the three of us here. Um, uh, there's a data from South Africa uh, collected by the uh, state government. Uh, we have a Tanzania data, Sudan, Ghana, and Central Asia, actually. So we are going to expand our agricultural uh, training data portfolio significantly this fall. Uh, we also have building footprints in Tanzania. So uh, the ML Hub is agnostic to the application, uh, but we have been mostly focused on agricultural land cover because of their uh, impact and priority across the development sector. Um, I want to conclude with a, also reference to a guideline that we work with the community around how can we better do ground referencing. So the key input to these training data sets is that data collection on the ground. Uh, and in many cases, that data collection is not necessarily for the purpose of generating training data. So sometimes it lacks the granularity or the metadata you need to match it with imagery and doing that. So uh, we have been working particularly with the CGIR team, the big data uh, platform team. Uh, and this uh, ground reference guideline is now available on our GitHub account. You can go to this bit.ly link ground reference guide and check that. There's also a webinar uh, recorded and uh, included in the GitHub that you can uh, listen to and uh, hear the discussions we had in that. Uh, this hasn't been possible without the help of our partners. Uh, they have been contributing data, technology, consulting, and uh, basically how can we do this better and the best practices. So we really appreciate this and we look forward to growing this uh, partnerships and collaborations with the other members of the community. Uh, with that, uh, I would thank you. And then these are the links to our website, uh, our GitHub channel, and also we have a Slack open uh, workspace that everybody can join. Uh, and talk to the other users of the community. Uh, thank you. That was excellent. Thank you so much, Hamid, and thank you, Catherine and Yao. I think that's a perfect setup and segue into kind of the discussion here and, and some of the topics that I really wanted to cover, um, given your expertise and experiences. So, so jumping right in, kind of my first set of questions is for Yao and Hamid. I want to talk about not just the kind of data sharing aspect of the ecosystem, but what does data adoption and usage mean? Does, and, and maybe we ask this question first of, does data sharing automatically mean that data will be adopted and used in your experience? And how do we as kind of practitioners avoid data getting shared, but then gathering dust and, and kind of defeating the purpose? So uh, yeah, maybe we'll start with you and then, and then jump to Hamid for that one. Thanks for that. Yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting and, and good question. Um, to answer it, you know, does data sharing automatically mean that somehow your data will be adopted and, and used? No, absolutely not. There's no, there's no guarantee in that way. Um, I think this is why it's important, you know, from, from our perspective as folks who are more focused on the data collection side, when somebody comes to us and says, I want to do a data collection project, we always start with, what are you going to use the data for? Um, because there's sometimes a mentality that says, well, we'll design a form and we'll gather every kind of data that is possible and then it'll, it'll just sit and not be used. So we actually start with the data usage. What, what are you going to use the data for? What are the, the indicators that you care about? Um, how are you going to analyze the data to get to those indicators that you get? And once you understand the usage and the analysis, then you can start talking about the collection. Then you can figure out exactly what data you need to collect at what you know resolution or, or frequency and so for us it's more about thinking about the entire data flow um, having a plan um, and if you can do that ahead of time then your data won't be gathering dust because you would have defined who's going to be using it what frequency um, and so that's that's what we say is that you have to start with the data usage then analysis then collection and then you can avoid collecting data that no one is ever going to ever going to use Makes sense to me. Hamid, anything to add to that? Yeah, no, I, I absolutely echo that, that, that it is not about just data being open. Uh, you, you, need, you need an ecosystem around it. That ecosystem should support, first of all, a data documentation. You start with, oh, this is not just a data file. There is a description of that, a human readable description that people can understand. Definitely connection to the application, we, we also see that. And then there is about tutorials and what I generally call software around it, right? How you can use these data. You talked about, oh, we have this like shareable link that you can put it in various interoperable format. These are really key features. And we think about it the same way on ML Hub. Anytime a data comes out, there's a tutorial. There's like a Jupyter notebook, how you can read this data out and use it in your application. 
and then the community around it, right? So that user community that uses the data and talks about it and discusses with each other, that is really a key aspect of it. It is not just a dormant file sitting on a web browser. No, it is, it is a community that uses this and progressively improves. So right from that usability, we hear from users, oh, this is how I'm using the data. It would be better if I had this feature on the API or how I access it. So you keep it a dynamic ecosystem and you improve it. Uh, there was a paper in Nature a couple of years ago called Open is not enough. That was the title. And it is the same thing. Open is not enough. It is not just about, oh, the data is open. No, you need that ecosystem. You need the software and the documentation. Uh, so yeah, we have been working with the users, particularly to understand their requirement when it comes to the ML. So our focus is how can we do this better when it comes to, uh, to training models using machine learning application. So keeping that in mind, we connect the dots to the geospatial world. Okay, how can we collect data better that it is useful for that ML application. Uh, and users are key in this ecosystem, definitely. Mm -hmm. No, it makes sense to me. And I, and I like that sentiment too, Hamid, of you know, open is not enough. Because I think, and, and to Yao's point, right, of understanding kind of your objectives and goals and, and, and use cases for data are, are mission critical. Um, Catherine, I'd, I'd love to hear from you in terms of when you have that right mix of things, what are the types of projects or outcomes or frameworks that you've seen enabled and possible because of data sharing, whether it's, you know, just internal to an organization or among partners, NASA Harvest in your kind of role, you, you work with a lot of partners, you work with Yao, you work with Hamid, you work with folks that are kind of across the ecosystem, work directly with farmers. What are the things that have been possible because of data sharing in your experience? Uh, so kind of to to bridge from the last, uh, from the comments, uh, both from, from Hamid and, and Yao, one of the things that came to my mind was, uh, there's so much value that can be harnessed with data that if you collected it and had it for your own use, you know, if it's like very critical in that year, you could just like do that project and walk away. But if you let it out, like other people can learn a lot of lessons. Uh, a lot of students have to collect data and learn all sorts of things. And it doesn't, if something's been collected, you know, it does no need for another person to go and collect the same data from the same people that, you know, could be, for me, one of the things that I keep thinking about is respondents fatigue. Like if it's like a questionnaire, if, you know, one organization was there a month ago and asking the same questions, like if there was some kind of mechanism for sharing information across, perhaps the community, you know, that is on, the receiving side of these questions, perhaps they don't have to go through it. And you could just like harness the power of all these different stakeholders. The resources to collect ground data just are enormous, you know, having teams go out, like in the case, um, yeah, I mentioned having people going and, and labeling fields on the ground, it's really a huge undertaking, but one organization can never really harness the value of those data. The other is, um, in the machine learning community, so many models uh, only it's only you know it's only possible to develop so many different models if so many people try it. Uh, an example was with was with Radiant Earth, the recent competition, like having many people look at it and come up with solutions to to make value out of it. It's just you know brilliant because then you can look at different models and how they compare. And in my case, if I have to go to a decision maker and 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 talk about you know, you know if you need a rapid kind of product you could compare these three different models and we can try and understand what, where they're performing well and where they're performing poorly. But um, going to your question more directly, uh, 2020 is a perfect year for why data sharing is important because we receive requests for, um, we need a land cover, we need a, a cropland map. So we know where all the farmers are in a country where we'd never worked before. Um, we got a, another request from Kenya. They wanted to assess how crops performed in 2019. Uh, we barely had any ground data from 2019 from Kenya. So if we're going to develop a cropland map that you can use to assess uh, conditions, you can't do that um, unless you have access to those, you know, to those data. And so having uh, the GeoWiki data set, which has points across the globe, and then using that to train a machine learning algorithm, and then uh, adding to that, uh, you know, on-screen labeling to be able to come up with more recent, you know, data points, and then translating that into a product that was needed, for example, by the Togolese government in 10 days is, you know, it's, it's, it wouldn't be feasible if those data didn't exist and if they were not like readily accessible. And so for me, that, you know, kind of points to 
if we really want to help the community, like if, if you really care about farmers in Togo and are collecting data in Togo, and there's this request, I think it is your responsibility to share those data because ultimately you are trying to help the farmer and organizations that are sharing data like Plant Village um, or One Acre Fund, you know, make it possible for researchers like us to be able to produce products that are actually in some cases very critical, like life-saving, you know, bringing a, a little bit of money to a farmer whose field has failed completely, which we can figure out if we have an updated cropland map, for example. So that's, I think, that's like, that's one of my best examples. And 2020 is the year of data, it should be the year of data sharing. You know, we're doing everything remotely. Um, it would be impossible otherwise. Mm -hmm. I love that. Well, well said, Catherine. And I, and I think that's also a, a perfect kind of segue into really what I want to talk about next, which is, is more focusing on the farmer, right? And, and kind of the data value chain perspective. So Catherine Hamid, I'd love for you both to weigh in on this, especially because I know you're both working together right now in Kenya and, and some, across some of these value chains. Hamid, would you say, do we have currently a healthy data value chain for smallholder ag? Um, and, and, you know, in, in terms of your commentary on that, what inf information gaps exist already, especially for farmers themselves? And, and you're welcome to speak specifically to Kenya or kind of a broader context, but I'd love to just start there. And then Catherine, I'd love to then hear your perspective on what do farmers think about all of this? You know, do they actually care about data sharing? Um, is this something that comes up in your conversations, you know, in the field with farmers? Are they looking for more information? Um, do we need to adjust our current models because we're not accounting for farmer needs? Um, love to hear more on, on that too. So Hamid, we'll, we'll start with you. Sure. Yeah, that, that's a very good question. And at the end, it's about farmers, right? We are doing all of these because of them, because they, they need to be more productive, have a, a more fruitful life and a production. Uh, I think we have good use cases of that, that good value chain, but we don't have it at a, at a scale. Uh, we have like project specific or regional specific value chains that work well. And I think about it this way that, hey, we are collecting data on the ground. Then there's a team doing analytics building models. Then there's a team deriving insights from that, feeding back to the policymaker. And then that information should also come back to the individual farmer as, if you may call it a recommendation or a decision point. Um, and this is not one organization doing all of this. These are multiple kind of uh, organizations and sectors that are working in this space. So that coordination, I think it's actually the tough part because everybody seems to do well in their own Silo, oh, I'm doing the perfect data collection, but okay, who, who is doing the modeling? I'm doing the perfect modeling, but who is really using that in practice? And sometimes this is actually more of a hype when it comes to the ML part, because everybody says, oh, I have the best ML model, X percent better than the other one, whatever the X is, right? So what? That is a question we always ask. Who is using it at the end? Uh, so I think what it, what it needs to become a sustainable value chain is a better coordination among these. As you mentioned, you know, we have been working with Catherine, uh, with you and others in the community who are working different sectors, but I think we have a, we have a long way to go. Uh, we have done good examples. Uh, we see the value of it. And I think uh, the impact is now sensible in some sense. People say, oh, it can be done. It can be achieved. It is good to do this, but we need to do it at a scale. Definitely there are barriers in terms of organizationals, uh, data privacy issues, cultural. There's a lot of other aspects to this. It is not just a technical list, uh, but we are on a good track. I'm, I'm happy where we stand and we are moving forward. Um, so the thing that comes, I think, in my mind is that last mile, um, like packaging and unpacking, like the value of you know, whatever models we've developed, whatever systems we have. This is incredibly challenging. I've seen, you know, examples of uh, projects that have been able to bring, um, you know, like analytics in a simple text message and kind of a target a farmer. But there's so many questions that go back. Like when you start looking at it, you start to question the resolution of the data, how it applies to the farmer. And then if the farmer has been, you know, approached and, you know, like how do you explain to the farmer how to interpret all these data? So there are all of those complexities. And um, Ahmed kind of mentioned a really good point about how we all do well in certain, in certain places. And I personally think that 
um, if we're talking about the remote sensing community, agriculture remote sensing community, the ones that do really good models or really good products, we're really doing poorly at getting that information to the farmer because that requires a whole different kind of skill set, which makes it really important for, for, important for partnering. And so um, I think like in my experience, like when I go to the field, so I work with extension agents a lot, they're farmers too. And um, a really good example in Mali, we work with the, a network of farmers and they uh, participate in this kind of working group. So they're both extension, farm, extension workers and farmers and they're the ones who are trained on how to use ODK. So they walk around, you know, they know how to like do the field boundaries and um, Hamid, I have to tell you the data from 2020 is so much better. So you should really look forward to it. Um, but like working with them and kind of explaining to them what you're doing and what it means in the end, it's they're very different things. And so one of our main, uh, I think my main contributions has been trying to improve the decision making process, which then would improve decisions that are made that can impact on a farmer. But it's absolutely critical that we figure out a way of um, communicating and some of the most effective things is like radio, like like working with the media and getting them to explain, you know, this is the, this is the result for, let's say for your region. Um, this is how you would translate it. Cause there are all sorts of radio programs for farmers. There are news articles and stuff like that that get published, but most farmers get their information from the radio. So if um, one really good example, I think is Microsoft. They had like this radio kind of Microsoft AI it had a radio type program. And this could be like a way of, like really improving what information the farmer is getting. It would be much better than a text message based on, you know, a 300 meter pixel that tells them that, you know, it's gonna rain or it's not gonna rain and then it actually rains. So I, I still think that we have, you know, there's like that other part that needs to be done, but it needs to be done properly. And um, it has to be communicated using the best channels. In most cases, an SMS text will get to all those farmers, but translating and actually using it might require like a radio program, for example. But that's a whole other realm, it's in, in, in my opinion, you know, based on like where, where we're comfortable working in that sense. But I, I'm looking forward to opportunities, you know, to work with partners who are trying to do that. Like in, in Mali, our partner, uh, Lutheran World Relief, this is like one of the core things they want to do. They want to be able to package information that will be relevant for those extension agents who then can work with the farmers that they support, which would be, I think, a, a fantastic, a fantastic contribution. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and I think what you said is, is really relevant too, Catherine, in terms of, you know, not underestimating the value of what I would call more kind of traditional or an analog approaches like radio and the place that they have alongside some of these kind of high tech, you know, space based and other approaches too. So yeah, so I think that's, that's incredibly important to keep in mind. Um, cognizant of time here, I've got at least another question for Yao and then hopefully we'll have time for maybe one other quick question across the panel. Yeah, you know, kind of taking a, a broader perspective in terms of enabling data sharing, you know, the cloud is behind a lot of that. And ODK, of course, as you said, it's just enabled, you know, uh, cloud services. But so much of the concern, I think, especially in working with, um, you know, country stakeholders and governments is around data sovereignty and, and kind of sharing data and, and hosting data. And, and how do we balance some of that and the advantages there um, with crowd, of cloud services with some of those privacy and data concerns and, and sovereignty? Yeah, that's a, a, a great question. Um, you know, I've been in the data collection game, as it were, for since 2008, so it's a long time. And so I've had the opportunity to sort of see how these sort of trends change. And I think um, for, for governments, we can just start with just like raw data. Uh, for raw data, the most important thing for governments is control. Uh, so obviously, you know, even from Europe, GDPR, California has a lot of rules. Essentially, there's less of a desire to host out of country on platforms where governments don't have any control. And so um, the good news is that the cloud is sort of becoming everywhere. You know, you can host, I think Amazon, for example, has cloud infrastructure now in, in, uh, in Cape Town, you know, so there's going to be more of these sort of standard cloud providers in country. So that solves some part of the problem. Um, the other option is that software and governments will start favoring software that enables them to host on their own infrastructure. Uh, 
and not just by spending hundreds of thousands of dollars, but like can the current team take this piece of software and host on our own infrastructure? So on ODK, we try to do both, right? We offer cloud hosting where you can host in any cloud in any country. But if you really want the software running on your own infrastructure, you can absolutely do that. And your IT team can support it. Uh, and if you need more help than that, ODK is sort of around and available to sort of support that. And so that's for raw data. We think we need that flexibility. Um, for things like uh, uh, process data, so somebody's collected the data set, they've cleaned it, they want to share it. You know, this is where it sort of ties into what Hamid said, that community matters. Um, and so you really sort of need an intermediary, somebody like uh, Radiant Hub um, or in the humanitarian uh health space, humanitarian debt exchange, somebody who's an intermediary who solves these sort of the details. So the sharing agreements, what the data quality has to look like, whether or not it has to have a data descriptive file and it should have to have a data descriptive file. Um, so all of these sort of things need to be managed by, by someone who has all the, you know, who has sort of the better view of the ecosystem because the individual partners, you know, if you're a researcher, you don't want to spend, you know, hours and hours making sure the data is in perfect condition before it can be shared. You know, ideally you wanna do the best that you can and hand off to somebody who can sort of help negotiate those kinds of things. So I think there, the way that we help governments tackle these kinds of sharing problems is to work with, you know, these intermediaries to make sure that the data quality is good. And there are great examples of this already. You know, Hamid's organization is a good one, humanitarian data exchange. Um, and then there are things like um, in the health side, uh, WHO has a bunch of working groups that standardize different forms and, and data sharing agreements. So um, it's not, you know, over the, I don't know, 10, 12 years that I've been working on it, it things have gotten a lot better. Uh, it's not as dire as I think it is. Uh, and so I'm really optimistic that there will be more data sharing um, as, you know, as we progress. Mm -hmm. Well, and thank you for that, Yao. I think it's, it's a lot of issues that you touched on in, in that one question. So I appreciate the, the great answer there. Um, and I know we're just at time here, so I need to wrap us up, but I wanted to take some liberties and do one quick last question across the panel, if you guys are good with me. Um, what's your, in, in kind of a quick answer, what's your one call to action? We've talked a lot about a community of practice, right? What's your call to action to that community of practice? What would be your number one priority, whether it's certain data you wanna be shared, certain practices you'd love to see implemented, certain projects you'd like to see taken on, uh, what's kind of the one one call to action? Um, Hamid, we'll start with you, then we'll go Catherine and Yao before we wrap. Um, I would reiterate that uh, if you can share your data, but think about it at the beginning of the project, not when you have done everything and then you want to share, then it's much harder to think about metadata and documentation. So think in advance and be open to sharing. Love it. Catherine? Uh, mine is, uh, it goes to Yao's point from before, uh, to demonstrate to governments the importance of sharing data. I think it's up to our community to demonstrate that when we have access to training data, we can develop better models that will be critical for the things that they want to do. And unless they share it, like for example, uh, from, uh, from a remote sensing perspective, having access to the Landsat data, a lot of the science in the past you know, 30 years has been about Landsat. And so having access to it and using it has you know, changed how we do things. And I, I, like, I would encourage uh, you know, governments to consider like, you know, really sharing uh, data because it will mean a big, big change and a benefit for the government, for sure. Excellent. And yeah, take us home, last thought. The last thought is for folks to participate. Uh, you know, I, I think um, you really have to be uh, participating in the process, engaging the stakeholders and showing up every day. Um, things don't happen overnight. They happen because somebody shows up every day and makes consistent progress. So what I ask for everybody that I work with is just to participate, engage with the process. If something's not going wrong, complain and you know work towards solutions. So yeah, I'll end there. I love it. And uh, I'll wrap us there with uh, first and foremost, a big thank you to our panelists, Yao, Ham, and Catherine. This was a fantastic discussion and, and I'm sure it's prompted a ton of food for thought, uh, pun intended. Uh, in terms of our audience there. And, and, and just in terms of kind of my own call to action, I'd, I'd really encourage the audience to think about connecting with these folks, especially one, because they're brilliant 
um, experts and practitioners in their own right, but I think as well, what you're hearing from everyone here is the, is the ethos and approach that we who are working in digital development really need to adopt, which is breaking down our own people silos and organizational silos uh, because a lot of the times it's not about the technical, right? It's it's about partnerships. It's about the coordination and the kind of nitty gritty to to make this work and and make it work for for farmers, which is which is why we're doing this. So, thank you again, everybody, for joining the session. Very much appreciated, and looking forward to the rest of the conference.